Hi everyone, welcome to your next criminology video. This is the final one for Unit 1, 1 1.6. So this is the final one for the first section of Unit 1. Uh, this one focuses on all the crime surveys, etc. So let's get started, let's have a look. So this one focuses on, this is the assessment criteria 1.6, it focuses on evaluating the methods of collecting statistics about crime. This one's a bit on the dull side. This one isn't particularly riveting, it's not particularly interesting, but you can't really do a course on criminology and crime without understanding how we get to these crime statistics in the first place. So it is necessary, it's just a bit on the dull side. So let's hammer through it, um, hopefully with no issues. So this shouldn't require you to evaluate methods of collecting statistics about crime and provide a detailed evaluation with examples of a range of methods, sources used to collect information about crime. So this topic is unique in that it's evaluating. You have to look at the strengths and the weaknesses, the strengths and limitations of these different ways. There are two ways of collecting information. The first is the recorded uh, crime statistics collected by the Home Office. The second is the SCEW, the Crime Service for English. England and Wales. So the first half of this PowerPoint video is going to be on the Home Office, the second half is going to be on the CSEW and, and each one goes through the same checklist. We look at reliability, validity, ethics, strengths and limitations and purpose of research. So extremely straightforward, that follows the same um, categories for each, just as I said a little bit on the dull side. So Police recorded crime. The Home Office provides police recorded crime, the PRC. Every month, each police force, there's 43 in the UK, reports to the Home Office, which is a government department, the number of crimes they have recorded in that area. So the offence type, the geography and the time period. These figures are then sent to the Office for National Statistics, the ONS, who publish the final statistics. These are public, you can see them. The statistics cover all notifiable offences, so all crimes tried by a jury plus some less serious crimes like assault without injury. So you can see what the crimes are in your area. If you go to www.police.uk, you can actually put in your postcode and see the crimes in your uh, area postcode. So the reliability of these, a method for collecting information about something that gives the same consistent result if repeated by different persons. So that's what reliability means. It means that it's, um, you can collect information and a different person would get the same consistent results. The strength of the Home Office statistics is that generally different officers and police forces, so the 43 all over the country, would be expected to follow the same procedures. They have the same book guidelines etc they use the same definitions of the crimes and so on the limitations however possible for different officers to classify the same incident differently so for example if a victim had minor scratches and attack one officer might classify this as assault without injury whereas another might say it's assault with injury Reliability also refers to accuracy for example errors can be made when recording the details of a crime or a victim so are they valid? What is the validity of the Home Office statistics? This validity means whether the statistics give us a true picture of the amount of crime. So are they valid? Do they give a valid representation of crime? Police recorded crime statistics may not do this, however. For example, the police recorded just over 45,000 rapes in 2016 to 17, but many victims do not report the offence and because the police may fail to record it. So... Still, 45,000 rapes in one year. That's just obscene. That is immense. And that might not actually be a valid picture of what is happening in this country. Oh, people may not report the crime if it happens to them. So then they go unrecorded. Police might not also record it all down if they think, again, um, without evidence or without um without anything to back it up, police might not always record it down. So for only 45,000 were recorded, but this might not be a valid representation of how many rapes there might actually be each year. Recorded crime figures do not include crimes that have not been reported. 
or incidences that police do not record down and we've looked at this throughout unit one so far this idea that police do not always record and write down um uh, crimes that get reported to them they may only record about 60 percent of the crimes that people report to them 60 percent 40 percent of crimes that are not recorded down how is that the case? How can a police officer make the judgment about whether a, a crime should be recorded or not? How can you then see patterns if these things are not made a record of? Home Office statistics, the ethics of research. Ethics refers to the issues of morality or right and wrong in research on crime. Because the individual offenders and victims are not identifiable from the Home Office statistics, just the overall number of offences, there is no ethical issue of breaching a person's privacy and anonymity is protected. For example, individual rape victims cannot be identified from the statistics or the total number of rapes recorded by the police. So generally their ethics are pretty high. Sorry, folks. Come on. I think it's the snow. Whoop, whoop. Let's, let's try that one again. So. The Home Office statistics, the purpose of this research. If the purpose of the statistics collected by the police is to give a valid and reliable picture of the amount of crime, then <coughs> they fail on that score. However, uh, sorry, likewise, since the statistics only tell us about the crimes, there's no help in understanding other issues such as the fear of crime or why the crimes happen in the first place. However, the police statistics can be useful in other ways. For example, it shows the measure of police activity, what the police are actually doing, an indicator of the crime trend, so where areas have more um, gang-related crimes or more thefts, etc. Also, um, it shows the well-reported and recorded crimes. All the strengths and limitations. A thief enters a changing room and steals the wallets from 20 pairs of trousers. Another thief steals one bank card but uses it 20 times to make contactless payments. Should both of these crimes be recorded as 20 offences? So 20 different wallets or one wallet 20 times. What do you think? Should they both be the same? Should one be treated more harshly than the other? We had a good discussion of this when we did it in lesson. This is known as the counting rules. The Home Office issues detailed counting rules. And the current rule is that the statistics should reflect the number of victims rather than the number of criminal acts. So the first example is 20 offences, but the second is only one. Not sure if, if what I think about the counting rule. What do you think? Do you think it works? Can you think of any examples where maybe it wouldn't work? Stabbing somebody once versus 20 times. I don't know if you then move into your, into your kind of intentions, murder, etc. I don't know. It's very interesting that they have counting rules. Um, but that's as it stands. So it's the number of victims rather than the number of criminal acts caused. Second half, the Crime Service for England and Wales, the CSEW. What is the Crime Service? So um, I recommend you either watch something on YouTube or just find out about what the Crime Survey is. It's the Victim Survey, which asks a sample of the population about their experiences of crime. It includes all types of crime, including those against children. This survey is important because it includes crime not reported to the police. So this makes it potentially more accurate. So the reliability of it. The strength is that it's conducted by trained interviewers asking the same set of questions. So the results are likely to 
be highly reliable. However, it is possible for different interviews to get different answers to the same question. So can you think of any examples where different interviewers might affect the answers given? Now, when we did this in class, we looked at rape victims and we discussed how um, a male interviewer versus a female interviewer might get different answers. We also looked at if a teenager was getting interviewed, if they got interviewed by a young person or an older person, then again, their answers might be different. So things like the sex of the interviewer or the age of the interviewer, or even the way that they speak, if you're northern versus southern, that might affect your answers. So yes, they might be trained. Yes, they might have the same questions, but the interviewer themselves might influence the person, the interviewee. The validity, the strengths, it uncovers a lot of crime that has not been reported to the police. Um, it also um, shows the dark figure of unreported. So when it has been reported, um, or, or, sorry, the unreported crime, but it also could show the unrecorded crime as well. So the dark figure of unrecorded crime. Limitations, however, because it is based on interviewees' answers, a victim may be unwilling to report it, unable to remember or misremember, unaware that the incident was a crime itself, unaware they'd been a victim. Um, and again, can you think of any examples of crimes where that victim might be unwilling or unable to report um, and crimes where they may be unaware that they're a victim? So unable to report might be abusive relationships when there's children involved, for example, um, or unaware that being a victim, child abuse. Sometimes the children do not know that something is wrong. Um, so do think about the examples that you would use. The ethics, there are very few ethical problems with the CSUW because there is no obligation to take part. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. And the interviews are anonymous and confidential. However, being a victim of a crime is traumatic and some people may experience distress in recalling the incidents to an interview with a stranger. The purpose of the research, it focuses on the victim. It helps to give a picture of people's day-to-day -day experience of crime and the effect on their lives. So this is more of a holistic understanding of crime. It's not just... Um, the, the crime statistics as the first one is uh, how many crimes are in a certain area it's about the individual themselves and how it's affected them it gives us a more valid picture of the impact of crime by giving a victim's eye view <coughs> sorry excuse me the findings can be used in crime reduction programs by identifying the groups and areas most at risk of being victims so you get more than just the stereotypes like what we had in the previous uh, topic other strengths and limitations, very high response rate. Three quarters agree to take part, so the results are quite representative of the population as a whole, so that's the representativeness. However, those that do refuse, why have they refused? What is it about that quarter that don't do it? Why have they not done it? So again, the information from them would have been very interesting. Also, although the sample is large, it may not be big enough to give a representative picture of the less frequent but very serious crimes. So, that's just a blast through the two different types of ways of collecting information about uh, crime, the crime statistics and the crime survey. Hopefully you found this video useful. If you do have any questions or problems though, either pop them underneath or come across the blog um, and I can answer you them on there. Otherwise, thanks very much for now guys. Let me cancel you down. Bye for now folks.